How's it going everyone, Brainchild here, and for our first E3 tech analysis, we're going to be taking a look at the brand new teaser trailer for the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now before we get started, I'll preface this analysis by saying that the footage in the trailer we're analyzing today appears to have been captured from in-engine cutscenes. It may not necessarily reflect the level of graphical fidelity that we can expect from the game during gameplay. But since the only major difference between the in-engine and in-game graphics in the first game was the level of detail management, the actual in-game graphics in the sequel may not be far off from what we're seeing in this trailer, which is entirely possible if the sequel takes advantage of the extra horsepower that the Switch hardware has compared to Wii U. So let's dive in and see what we can find. The depth of field effect here seems to be of similar quality to the first Breath of the Wild game. It functions like bokeh depth of field, but not necessarily at cinematic quality where you get smooth, clean bokeh shapes based on the shape of the aperture. Still looks great though, and the particle detail and animation work is fantastic. So one visual element that was pretty prominent in the first Breath of the Wild was the representation of atmospheric particulate matter through the use of me scattering algorithms and fog effects. We can see that the swirling particles here aren't just brightly colored textures, but actually emit light and illuminate the fog with a green hue, emulating a light scattering technique known as fog inscatter. It's not just a generic ambient light either. We can see that the radius of the light source has fall off based on its intensity. So the parts of this cavernous structure that are closest to the light source will reflect light more strongly than surfaces that are farther away from that source. The point of representing lighting in this way is to really ground the particles in the scene so that they feel three-dimensional, since emissive particles can't use shadows on themselves as a depth cue. Throughout the trailer, try to pay attention to how the particles illuminate the environment, because being underground without sunlight or moonlight, most of the lighting in the environment will have to come from some form of cold body radiation, aka luminescence. It's really impressive. There are a couple things I love about this shot. First, it looks like the fire animation has a physics component like the last game, where a character walking with a torch or the wind blowing on fire would influence the fire animation. Here, we can see something animators refer to as drag, where the movement of one part of an overlapping action lags behind another part due to a difference in weight or some other property between both parts. With the fire being exponentially lighter than the base of the torch, the fire lags behind, moving in the opposite direction the torch travels. Also note the fire embers breaking away in the direction of the drag, as they oscillate within the specific range of luminosity. Then we have the light flicker on the surface of the cave wall here, contrasted by the normal map macro and micro surface detail and shadow. This might all seem unnecessarily technical, but all of this comes together to bring life to the scene in a way that feels tangible and believable. So while you may not necessarily notice all of these details individually, you certainly will notice the feeling of mystery, atmosphere, and adventure when scenes like these are done right. So this is interesting. Here we can see the fire service omnidirectional shadow casting light sources. Not only did the fire in the first Breath of the Wild not cause objects to cast omnidirectional shadows, the objects illuminated by fire didn't cast shadows as a result of that illumination at all. In the first Breath of the Wild, the only light sources that caused objects in the environment to cast shadows were directional light sources, like the sun and the moon. Any local light sources like torches or Sheikah technology only illuminated objects, so this is a pretty significant graphical improvement. Of course, this is just trailer footage of presumably in-engine graphics, so it remains to be seen if the real-time in-game graphics of Breath of the Wild 2 will also support this feature. Something else I'd like to point out about this scene is that these glowing crystals here are truly emissive as evidenced by them illuminating their local surroundings with relatively physically accurate fall off proportional to its radiant flux. So looking at the cell shading of the character models here, I would say that this is a significant improvement over the cell shading implemented in the first game. Unlike the first game, which used just two tones of light and dark for the base shading, they're using three tone shading, not counting the specular highlights and Fresnel reflections. These three tones represent the diffuse reflection of direct light, shadows with ambient lighting, and near opaque shading, respectively. The last one taking on a function similar to the dynamic ambient occlusion solutions used on realistically shaded character models. Cell shading doesn't use color gradients like real life, but color bands instead. The more bands you use, the more realistically you can represent light fall off, which is important if you want to add more depth to the objects being cell shaded. What's nice about using three tones for cell shading is that a character's model can still retain their depth and definition when the model has self shadowing or is completely covered in shadow, without compromising the strong, cartoonish like contrast of light and shade that cell shading is known for. Brilliant choice here. So, just like the first game, we can see evidence of physically based rendering here. 
Notice the sharp divide between the fire illumination on the ground compared to the water. But on the surface of the water, there's no illumination along the boundary due to the law of energy conservation. Instead, we see specular highlights reflecting on the water's surface in a smaller surface area. But also much more intensely, which is consistent with how light behaves in the real world on specular reflective materials like water. There's also some nice refraction of these crystals along the water's surface. On the other hand, the light sources from these crystals don't appear to be reflected underneath the water's surface, as we can see with the contrast of light on this stone pillar above and beneath the water. This was a rendering limitation in the first game, so I'm assuming it has something to do with the deferred engine's lighting stage in the rendering pipeline. And if that is indeed the case, I don't really see that changing in the future, but who knows. This camera angle also allows us to get a better view of the omnidirectional shadow casting. Note how Zeldas in this animal shadows are cast in different directions from the same light sources. So the shading we can see under this rat is known as a contact shadow. When objects are close to the ground, they cast a dark shaded region along the contours of the parts of the object that intersect with the ground. Basically, it's ambient occlusion, but specifically for surfaces near the ground. What's cool here is that we have yet another shadow casting emissive local light source, something notably absent from the first game, which was understandable because using lots of shadow casting light sources simultaneously can get really computationally expensive. There aren't many video games on consoles that enable more than, say, two or three shadow casting light sources at a time. I don't know how many will be enabled in this game, but I'd be happy to have just one directional shadow caster for the sun and moon, and one local shadow caster for portable light sources like torches. I should also point out that the shadow resolution appears to be pretty decent, though that was also the case with the in-engine cutscenes of the first game, which didn't really translate to the same level of fidelity in-game. We'll just have to see if that will also be the case with this game. Okay, this shot is just stunning. The scale, the geometry, the local illumination, it's utterly breathtaking. Even more notable is the use of me-scattered HDR bloom effects. This is a more realistic use of bloom lighting, where the detail of the emissive light source is not lost, even as it faintly scatters its glow in the surrounding atmosphere. The denser the atmosphere, the larger the radius of the bloom scattering. Suffice to say, this is bloom lighting done right. These emissive particle effects once again look quite lovely. Now this animation can be pretty easy to miss, so I've decreased the playback speed a bit so you can get a better look at it. But take a look at this follow through animation once the glowing entity catches the forearm here. The hand goes limp and dangles a bit afterward. This is incredible attention to detail and really allows the viewer to feel the impact of the grasp the very moment it happens. Very, very cool. Love the imagery here. Large shadows in a dark setting is a pretty common trope used to evoke spooky vibes, but technically all you have to do is place an intensely bright point light very close to the object casting a shadow in order to produce the effect. If you have a small flashlight, you can do the same thing at home by shining that light close to a miniature figurine, for instance, in pitch blackness. Give it a shot when you get the chance. So the plumes and clouds of dust caused by the ground breaking apart here look like they could use a little more environment lighting. As they are right now, they look a bit out of place compared to everything else in the scene. Just compare them to the fog we can see here, which is properly illuminated. They're probably just generic billboards, not really programmed to check what lighting environment they're in, but unfortunately they look superimposed onto the environment without appropriate lighting, so hopefully that's changed in a later build of the game. What's amazing about Breath of the Wild's renderer, or the execution of it anyway, is just how well the artists have been able to implement cell shading while still using a physically based framework. As we can see here, cell shaded metals still look like metals thanks to the addition of the specular lighting pass on the materials, which changes with view direction. And we can even see that highlights on metals are properly tinted with their own colors, just like in real life. It's this wonderful balance between realism and stylism that makes the execution of Breath of the Wild's art style so impressive. And personally, I'd say it's a masterclass in the combination of art design and the rendering of computer-generated 3D animation. Outdoors is looking pretty similar to the first game, graphically speaking, but that's not really a bad thing when the first Breath of the Wild was already pulling off most of the rendering features found in modern AAA titles today, even if the quality of those features wasn't quite as high as those aforementioned titles. Best of all, it was all done in real time. Like the first game, we can see real-time Rayleigh scattering, which dynamically changes the color of the sky based on the position of the sun. Procedural cloud propagation, which are clouds that have dynamic morphology and are influenced by the wind simulation system. Increased density of me scattering near the horizon to make the world seem even bigger than it already is. And double-sided shading of vegetation in order to emulate the phenomenon of subsurface scattering. I will say, the level of detail in the overworld here seems to be of much higher quality at this distance compared to the first game. 
But again, seeing as this is likely an in-engine cutscene, that doesn't really tell us much about the level of detail quality in-game. Overall, I'm absolutely floored with this game's visuals. I was already impressed with what the devs were able to pull off with the first game, especially considering it was originally designed around the Wii U's architecture, but the execution of the art style in the sequel so far seems to have taken the engine's prowess to the next level. If the game already looks this good, I can only imagine what it'll look like upon release. And that's all for this early tech analysis of the newly revealed trailer for the sequel to Breath of the Wild. If you like this video, feel free to give it a like and share your thoughts with us in the comments below. And be sure to stay tuned to Game Explain for lots more E3 coverage and all things gaming. Cheers!